Okay, so this lecture today, week three, is on bone tissue. And bone is a very, very interesting tissue from an extracellular matrix standpoint. It uses a very special material. It's a, it's a mineral. Uh, I think that, and then you have teeth, which actually have ceramic, which is kind of really cool too. In any case, we're going to be talking about bone tissue and, and aspects of uh, function. So we got some questions here on this first slide. What are the two main types of bone tissue? See if you can't just go ahead and write down, uh, or at least uh, at least say in your mind what those two types of bone tissue are. It's because the more you can internalize this stuff, the easier it will be to recall uh, down the line. So got your uh, got your two types written down. Really, just uh, two words. Okay, so you shouldn't have too much trouble. Okay, so here goes the answer. The first one is called compact bone. You can see a picture of it here, here, and here. Now, if you look real closely at this image, you can see an outer layer. Okay, you can also see it right here. This is compact bone. The other type is spongy bone, also known as cancellous. Okay. That's what you're seeing here and here, and you can see it inside these areas right here. Cancellous bone, uh, especially in the long bones, harbors um, harbors marrow. So, uh, so we have two types there, compact and cancellous. Next question, what is the main mineral in the ground substance of bone? That is to say, what is the primary mineral outside of, and each one of these little black things here is basically a cell. All right. I know that's not always easy for you guys because um, sometimes that may look more like a nucleus. Okay. There's a big opening right here. That's a central canal. Okay. And there are actually other openings as well. We'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, but the primary mineral, Ground substance is just another way to say extracellular matrix. Okay, uh, it's an older term. So, uh, any guesses? Well, this one's kind of fun because I, I always remember because I'm hungry a lot. So, the name of this mineral is called hydroxyapatite. Not with an E. If it was E, that would mean that I'm hungry for water or something. This is hydroxyapatite. And it's actually a two-part molecule. It actually has two parts. That's why you don't reduce the numbers all the way. And I'm not going to ask you to recall that formula. Don't even don't even go there. What we do have, though, you do kind of want to remember that name of that. It's hydroxyapatite. Turns out hydroxyapatite is used in uh, toothpaste. It helps restore uh, tooth uh, tooth material and so forth. How many bones in the adult human body? Well, it does vary. You know, there is a little bit of variance out there. Like, for instance, if you have two spinal um, bones fused together, I guess that makes it one bone, right? Well, you know, it just depends on your point of view, I guess. The answer to this is about 206 on average. All right. The vast majority of people out there have 200, and, and, and vast majority of adults anyway, have 206 different identified bones. So some important functions for bone. It's more than uh, than we might think. The first, uh, the most obvious one is uh, support of the body. The things like posture or the ability to move on to legs, bipedalism. Um, so super, super important there. Um, and in fact, the different bones have different roles in, the, in that support. For instance, um, as we stand on our legs, there is a force of the weight of the body down towards the ground pressing on, let's just uh, use the femur, for instance, that force is compressing the femur. And so the compact bone will uh, provide structure that resists that compressive force. Now, inside a femur, we also have spongy bone, and in lots of other bones, we have spongy bone. Um, and that one is for the twisting. That's what torsion means, either a twisting or, or a fulcrum type type motion. Um, not exactly tension per se, but more like a displaced force across the length of the bone. That's called torsion. Certainly protect internal organs, not the least of which is the brain, certainly the eyes, and, 
and endocrine organs way down inside behind your nose. Um, the, the major vital organs like your heart underneath your uh, rib cage, uh, your kidneys, same way. So in, especially vital internal organs. It's not to say your small intestine and your large intestine aren't vital, but they uh, you can afford to lose a little bit there compared to, or certainly your, your skeletal muscle and stuff. You can afford to lose the, those latter th those other things compared to you know things like your heart or your kidneys. Point of attachment for muscle, okay, uh, you know muscle generates force by shortening, so you have to have attachment points on that muscle, otherwise it uh, it will not be able to generate force. We have red marrow, and the red marrow is full of precursor cells. Uh, we call those hematopoietic stem cells and precursor cells for red blood cells, certainly, but also white blood cells. So uh, neutrophils, basophils, and so forth. And also lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are, are immune cells that we find actually primarily in the lymphatics. We find them in lymph nodes and in lymphatic tissue. Um, but uh, those are all, they all get their start in the red marrow. We also happen to have yellow marrow where we store fat as well. And this combination of red and yellow marrow makes uh, bone marrow a coveted ingredient um, in, in all sorts of cooking around the world, certainly French cooking. Uh, and, and other places around the world uh, re recognize the nutritional and caloric value of marrow. And so it's considered a, actually a delicacy. Uh, many broths are made out of uh, bone marrow, whether it's chicken bones make chicken broth or uh, beef bones make beef broth. We can, uh, it's a dynamic reservoir for calcium. So if you have low blood calcium, uh, the body will recognize that and send out hormones that tell the, the osteocytes to begin breaking bone down. It actually causes the osteocytes to begin uh, turning into osteoclasts, okay? And if you have a sufficient amount of calcium in your uh, in your bloodstream, um, the hormones may actually tell the, the osteocytes to become osteoblasts, and osteoblasts are the cells that lay bone down. And you're cycling through your, your, your uh, bones. It's kind of really cool. And as I mentioned in the first slide, it's calcium phosphate, and so phosphorus is important. We use a lot of phosphorus in our DNA, uh, and phosphorus has other roles uh, throughout the body, including uh, protein regulation and so forth. So it's a dynamic reservoir for calcium and phosphorus. Osteocalcin is one of the hormones. It doesn't have to be capitalized. Okay, I, I don't know why it's capitalized in this slide, but in any case, I just it just bothers me. It should It doesn't have to be uppercase. It's a hormone. Uh, it's from osteoblasts, and, and, and what it does is it, it affects other tissues that uh, affect the rate of absorption of calcium from the digestive tract and that sort of a thing. And so it's a marker for, for blood for, formation, among other things. Some general aspects of bone structure. Uh, we do have some variety across the uh, bones, and but the uh, overall the most common motif when it comes to bones is that you're you have an outer layer, shall we call it a cortex? That's what that word means, outer layer of compact bone, and inside that compact bone layer you have a medulla. All right, it's sandwiching cancellus, aka spongy bone. So you have a cortex and a medulla when it comes to bones. We have a category of, of bones called long bones. That's where they have one dimension that's longer than the than the uh, width, okay, femur, humerus, and the distal bones in the fingers and toes, the phalanges. We also have short bones, and these conclude um, the more proximal bones in the feet, the tarsals and uh, the hands, the carpals. And we also have these what are called sesamoid bones. They're, they're, they're found in, in tendon. And so not, not super common, but they're there. And those are because they have a cube-like structure, they are considered short. We have flat bones. We call them diplo, all right? Sometimes you see the E with a little unlaut, like diploe or something, but it's diplo. This includes your sternum, scapulae, the, the flat 
parts of the pelvis and the cranial bones. So they are they are very very they have a very very wide x and y axis and are relatively thin in the z axis. Then we have what are called irregular bones. These ones don't kind of conform to the standard situation. Uh, vertebrae are, are in that. Um, they're just uh, unique in their shape and structure. When it comes to compact bone, you have a very, very distinct morphology. It looks like, um, like tree rings. Okay? That tree ring is actually one what is known as an osteon okay it's these concentric layers of hydroxyapatite where you have a central canal okay that's uh, the central canal that houses arteries veins and nerves okay and then you have these little spots and I'll show them up here as well that are known as lacuna these lacuna are little spaces and inside the lacuna, you have an osteocyte. Now, they could be an osteoblast, it could be an osteoclast, but all more, most often it's a, it's a relatively static osteocyte. And you can see these lacunae are far, relatively far apart in cellular terms. These cells aren't really touching each other all that much. Okay, And so you have the central canal, you have lacunae, and inside the lacunae you have osteocytes. So what is the in the central canal? Okay, arteries, veins, and nerves. Now these lamellae, these concentric rings, contain the uh, the majority of hydroxyapatite, but they are bathed. You know there are spaces in between here. There is what are called canaliculi. They're kind of you can kind of see them. It's kind of that gives it that sort of woody look to it. Um, those canaliculi allow for fluid exchange, and so that's where interstitial fluid is. Um, the cells themselves um, need to be uh, kind of adhere to the to the the, the bone, and so there you'll find binding proteins. Again, this is extracellular matrix, also known as ground substance, and so these cells will anchor, and those those binding proteins also tell the cell to not die. The default pathway of a cell, if it's just out of place, is to apoptose, is to die. And so those binding proteins not only anchor the cells, but they also say, hey, you're in the right spot. You're doing okay. Gags are also known as a little more complicated word called glucose aminoglycans. Um, again, that this means that there's, there's a sugar moiety, there's an amino group, and then they have these sort of uh, again, a, a kind of a it's kind of a complex carbohydrate. All right, glucose aminoglycans they serve important signaling roles and nutritional roles, and then lastly some minerals that includes calcium, phosphorus, uh, and other minerals that might be deposited. Um, I'm trying to think, there is one that deposits. Oh, fluoride. Fluorine will deposit in bone if you're taking it up at a significant level. And this is one of the reasons why. You normally don't want to swallow your toothpaste. It's okay to swallow it from time to time, but um, swallowing it on a regular basis, and if you're doing a fluoride treatment, they really don't want you to swallow it. Fluoride can strengthen bone in very, very small quantities. But we've found um, in uh, Yellowstone National Park, the, 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 the spring water from the geysers and stuff there has a really high concentration of fluorine. And while the animals do well in the winter because the water's nice and warm and they, they can eat all year round because the water's warm and it warms up some of the stuff around the, the springs and stuff, because of the high fluorine, their teeth actually get weaker. And so they actually die a premature death because um, because they uh, they the teeth are so full of fluorine that they're actually weaker than a normal uh, tooth. A little bit of fluoride is good. A lot of fluoride, eh, maybe not. Okay, the concept of the homeostatic window. Um, there is some fibers, uh, you know, extracellular matrix in there as well. It's primarily collagen. Uh, question mark here. That's the cancellous bone, the spongy bone, along with red and yellow marrow and so forth. All right, and so you can see it's a it's a comp you know not not a super complex architecture. The main thing is get that canal down. Know some of these uh, some of these basic terms like okay, lamellae are the rings, lacunae are the sort of side 
you know, uh, the spaces where the cells are, and then you have a canaliculi, which allows for uh, fluid circulation. And here's a zoom in on a single osteon, a single ring-like structure. Okay, so there are the concentric lamellae, a central canal. All right, lacunae. Canaliculi, you can kind of see are these radial uh, structures. When it comes to long bones, they have some structural similarities and, and a lot in common. And so we're going to look at some of those uh, general uh, uh, anatomical similarities. The first thing is that when you have a, an articulating surface, there's, you know, and that's what articular means, that, that this is where the, the bone will will swivel on, on a contact with uh, either with another bone or another structure of the body. Um, that's, it's composed of a hyaline form of cartilage. It's called articular cartilage. Again, where the bone articulates, where it, uh, where it connects to another bone, etc. The epiphysis, all right, the epiphysis in the case of the femur is actually quite, uh, quite striking. Uh, not quite so much in other long bones, but certainly in the in the femur, the epiphysis is a very, very noticeable bulging at the end. You have a distal one and you have a proximal one. Um, in any case, that's the bulging at the end of a long bone. Then you have the diaphysis, which is the shaft portion of that bone. So here's the diaphysis. And inside the diaphysis, this is where you're going to have a, you know, a cavity that contains yellow bone marrow, etc. Around most bones, uh, you have a double layer of uh, a cartilage-like tissue. Uh, connective tissue, it's dense, it's irregular. Um, it's called, there are two layers to it. One's called the periosteum, that's the outermost layer. Peri means outside or, or furthest away, distal and peri are in some cases, but peri implies more of a surrounding thing rather than distal. In any case, the periosteum is, uh, is dense irregular connective tissue that, that sheathes the bone, and it contains uh, bone precursor, you know, osteocyte precursors, and as well as osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Now, <clears throat> the 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 osteocytes do can flip back and forth. There is, it is known that uh, when given uh, certain hormones and cytokines, that these things can and do change the uh, the expression of genes and then makes them, you know, thus changes their function. But the majority of these are going to be found in the the layers outside of the bone uh, in the periosteum or the inner layer called the endosteum. Um, again, it's a little more like areolar cartilage or uh, connective tissue, but it has the same cells. All right. So we have dense irregular connective tissue on the outside, a little more supple connective tissue on the inside. And then again, this serves as a, as a, as a house for, um, cell, for cells that will modify and grow bone. Medullary cavity, again, this is uh, in the, usually in the, uh, the uh, diaphysis. Uh, and what you have here, this is primarily uh, yellow marrow. Um, red marrow would be found up here in, inside the epiphyseal medulla, okay, where the spongy bone is located. Lots of yellow marrow in here. There's also this thing called an epiphyseal line. Sometimes uh, when, when it's actively growing, usually prepubertal, pubertal, excuse me, before you know, right up and leading right up into puberty, um, this 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 no longer this is not a line. They call it an epiphyseal plate, a growth plate, and that's where you see the most enhanced growth of the bone in terms of lengthening the shaft. Now in gals, you, your epiphyseal plates will close a little sooner uh, than guys will. Guys can go well into their college years. Um, late late teens and early 20s in some cases. Um, there have been examples of people who've gone into military academies um, and uh, they grew another several inches while in the military and actually went outside of the normal range of a military uh, uh, size uh, and became NBA basketball players in some cases. So that's the epiphyseal plate. But when it when it when it closes, when when the cells stop growing. It creates a, a, a thin line of, of dense bone there called the epiphyseal line.
And then you have arteries and veins uh, that service the bone. Uh, they enter at various spots. You can find the you can find those openings if you look carefully on on bones. So as we mentioned in the previous slide, in the epiphysis, this is where you find the cancellous bone, um, and this is where you find uh, red, you know, cell blood cell precursors, what we would call hematopoietic cells. And then the diaphysis, see what you find is, is primarily fat tissue there. When bones form, and this isn't something that's just human, it happens in mammals and in reptiles and other, and other organisms, you have two major ways that, that bones ossify, that is to say, lay down the mineral and, uh, composition and extra membrane composition uh, of these bones. One is called endochondral, and the other is called intramembranous. Now, endochondral normally forms the, the longer bones and the non-flat bones, shall we say, uh, the long and short bones, but not the flat ones. They, what you get is a sort of a collar-like. You get a sort of a, a collar that forms in the, the diaphysis, and it sort of moves distally in both directions. Now, as, as the bone lengthens, you start to get a, a sort of a... Uh, you're replacing uh, the, the cartilage um, template with a bone structure. And so you will have deteriorating cartilage, cartilage with a supplementary um, uh, hydroxyapatite collar, if you will. And as it grows, then other tissues begin to evolve, like, for instance, the, the uh, vascular tissue and the neural tissue will actually move into. It's actually a sort of an invasive process, if you will. Now, as the diaphysis gets longer, you will get secondary ossification in the areas where you're going to get articulations, where you're going to get uh, different shape structures. So you have this diaphysis growing, and you have these secondary ossification centers. And between those two is where you get that sort of epiphyseal plate because you've got growth going on here and you've got growth growing here as well. So all right up until with uh, girls, it can be to age 12 to 15 or so. Uh, with guys, it generally goes later, um, usually maybe as late as 19 or 20 in, or even later in some cases. Um, there have been players drafted into the NBA out of college or and and then in then playing in the NBA they grow several inches um, you know because because of the late closing of the epiphyseal plate now that's endochondral it's kind of a collar like extension and then you get secondary ossifications at the articular surfaces uh, um, or the epiphyses if you will then you have intramembranous, and the way to remember intramembranous is to look at a turtle shell. Can you see these kind of, kind of ring-like structures? It's very a turtle shell is very flat, and it turns out turtle shells are intramembranous bone. Uh, you can also think about your skull in this way, or your scapulae. With intramembranous ossification, what you get is you sort of get a center of ossification. And it sort of works its way in a, in a shall we say, our, in, in, a, in a larger concentric pattern. So if you go back and look at that turtle shell again, you can sort of see the ridges are forming these sort of almost concentric uh, growth. And that's what's happening is it's starting from a center and radiating out. Rather than working in, say, a two-dimensional thing, it's radiating out, you know, in all directions. And so you deposit, and, and, and this, this center grows and expands, and eventually at some point you're going to start to develop uh, the makings of an internal spongy with an outer uh, uh, compact form here. But even so, this morphology is moving, is spiraling outward from that original center, if you will. Um, and then the diplo, that's the that's where the spongy bone is uh, in in uh, in the bone, uh, and the spongy bone houses uh, red marrow for uh, uh, blood cell differentiation and maturation. So bones do uh, get modified over the entire lifespan of the individual, 
But in terms of the, the dimensions, in terms of the overall thickness and length, most of that happens after birth. Uh, obviously, you have to be able to fit through the pelvic window at birth or, the, or, or it's not going to work. You're not, never going to make it out of the mother's body. So the, the bones are considerably smaller uh, at birth, and then uh, much of that growth occurs postnatally. Um, in terms of length, that's the epiphyseal plate. Until you reach uh, until you reach um, uh, adolescence, again a little sooner in women, uh, uh, estrogen is a is a, an epiphyseal modifier, and so you're getting uh, you're getting this uh, this bone growth um, th through the epiphyseal plates primarily for length. In terms of thickness, what you've got is you've got a sort of a, uh, an outward radiation. It's it's more like intramembranous. That's kind of the intramembranous thing, and it's growing in both directions. Uh, we call oppositional growth. So what we've got going on is that these uh, the periosteal cells can and do uh, as the bone grows differentiate into blasts, which lay down uh, secrete extracellular matrix that then polymerizes and crystallizes. Now those osteoblasts will get uh, will get entrapped in that secretory process, and under under um, standard circumstances will form a relatively quiet osteocyte. Um, and and but they can these osteocytes can and do flip back and forth between a blast which is laying material down and a clast which is taking material up right yes you can they communicate through interstitial fluid via the canaliculi which are these microscopic channels in the in the crystal in the uh, hydroxyapatite crystal to allow for signaling and uh, nutrition purposes so here's a nice picture of the epiphyseal plates here above and below the knee joint and if you look closely in this epiphyseal plate, you can actually subdivide different zones. Uh, for instance, there's a resting zone where not a whole lot's going on. This is basically uh, mostly um, extracellular matrix. But below that, the first zone, and then we're going from, you know, uh, we're going from superficial to deep. So this is primarily cartilage up here. Then you have the proliferation zone where these cells begin dividing. Now, it's tough to see in this picture, but if you were to zoom in on these cells, you would see a lot of mitotic uh, structures, uh, spindles, and, and so forth that indicate cells actively in mitosis. But after that, after that proliferation phase, those cells begin to grow. That's what we mean by hypertrophic zone. They're not dividing as much, and so their cytosol is accumulating. They're also uh, beginning to... to um, secrete material and so forth and that's where we have the calcification zone where these cells are actively secreting um, uh, mineral tissue now are the chondrocytes dying are they being replaced by osteocytes yes so you have some of these cells that are mitosing we're going to form uh, osteocytes and uh, the chondrocytes uh, generally just shut down and eventually die whereas the remaining cells that are still alive are actively secreting hydroxyapatite and, uh, and are living. And then down here at the bottom, we have, um, we have uh, more of that bone material. There's more of uh, the extracellular matrix. So this is where we have fully calcified uh, bone. The next few slides, we have several pictures uh, just showing you the bones. And again, you can always kind of spot that epiphyseal plate right there can't quite see it in the fibula it's probably sitting some you know fibula isn't that uh, isn't a major support of bone so it doesn't quite have the same you know it's there it's just that it's a lot harder to see um talus yeah i can kind of see it over a little bit over here on the right now here what we can see you have your flat bone Okay, it's growing in a slightly different way than the, the long bones are. You don't have epiphyseal plates. You can also see the unusual um, vertebrae bones. Those are very different. They grow in a very different way. 
Um, epiphyseal plate uh, would kind of be in this area here. And you're going to have a secondary one uh, in the shaft. It's a little bit tougher to see. This is a more mature person. The epiphyseal plates have closed. Um, not a lot else here to show. Same story here. Um, interestingly, you can see some of the spaces of the large intestine here. That's kind of cool. Um, again, a more mature adult. Uh, I could just make out a, a, a little epiphyseal plate right there, and there's a little one right there. Here's a good example. This is a this is a cross section, and you can see where the that dense bone and that cancellous bone is found, and then you have more dense bone here uh, again. Uh, and this is part of the pelvis here, so you can you can see the the difference between the the dense bone cortex and the cancellous medulla. And so bones generally stop growing in length once you sort of reach, uh, you know, puberty. And that's because the whether or not a bone grows depends on how much growth hormone, thyroid hormone, and other sex hormones, including estrogen uh, uh, and so forth. This is why when uh, girls enter adolescence, their, their, their amount of estrogen, progesterone, and so forth kicks in, and that generally shuts down bone growth. Um, in men, it's a little bit different. It's, it's a ratio because the bones are dynamic. They can grow again, or they can keep growing. The world's tallest man, he died in his 20s. He was still growing at 8 feet 11 inches. That's because he had a tumor in his anterior pituitary that was secreting boatloads of growth hormone. And it just basically oh, it swamped out the effect of the other bones, or the other hormones, excuse me. Bones can and do remodel depending on the forces that are involved. This is known as Wolf's Law. Um, this is the what I call the, the law of braces. So when you get braces on your teeth, what you are doing is creating asymmetric forces on your jawbone and your maxilla. It's literally melting bone and then bone is forming behind it as you're moving the teeth using those forces. So if you walk a lot, like for instance, if we look at um, bones from the Roman Empire, everybody walked with rare, rare exception. And so if, they, if you compare those bones to that of the modern day person, their bones in their femurs and their tibias and their ankles and, and, the, and, the, um, and the interface and the articulation with the hip, much, much more robust. That's because generally people just walked everywhere. It was rare that somebody would ride in a chariot, very rare, less than one per 1,000 people. And even if you're riding in a chariot, you still didn't do that all that much. Probably, probably nobility were the only ones who didn't walk to, uh, to a significant degree. But everybody else, you know, if you go to, uh, 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 to a, an archaeologic site, you can see a much more robust leg structure because of how people use their legs more than we do now. Now, when we remodel, and, and there, there, is a, there is a general remodeling going on, you cycle through bone tissue about every 10 to 20 years. You're always sort of regenerating bone due to the fact that the bones are undergoing stress and, 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 and the crystals kind of break down, so they kind of need to be regenerated. Um, the, the bone remodeling, what you have to do is you have to break down um, uh, the old bone before you can lay down the new bone. And it's kind of a, it's kind of like a pitting. It kind of, it kind of, the bone kind of looks like a golf, the surface of a golf ball. And sometimes you need to release calcium for things like nerve and muscle function. Calcium is super important for cardiomyocytes and, and so forth. So if you're low calcium, your bones will break down a little bit more. That's kind of the basis of osteoporosis. Now, the cells that are involved in this bone remodeling and breakdown are the osteoclasts. These ones will uh, dissolve the bone and release uh, calcium. And then you have the osteoblasts, which release uh, hydroxyapatite and build up bone. And whether the bone is 
gaining or losing mass depends on uh, the ratio of cells that are acting in an osteoclastic way versus ones that are osteoblastic. And we're still trying to figure it all out because these things can and do sort of flip. Now, one thing that's uh, significantly different about osteoclasts versus osteoblasts is that osteoclasts are sort of fused cells. They, they sort of form these multinucleated, um, you know, Frankenstein-looking cells that are involved in dissolving and uptaking uh, uh, the, the, the mineral. Osteoblasts are mostly or thought to be uh, mononuclear, and if they're switching between the two, that sort of means that they fuse for a little bit and maybe they dissociate. It's still a work in progress. It, it, there's a lot to learn, just like we need to learn more about osteoporosis. Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with what cell signals are uh, that these cells are seeing. Talk a little bit about pathophysiology. Um, bones uh, serve a very important homeostatic role, but uh, they can and do undergo pathophysiology. And the most common pathophysiology is fracture. Okay. So let's go through these and then I'll show you the picture over here on the right. So a common muted is a very serious bone fracture. Very, very serious. That's because the bone has basically been shattered into three or more pieces, which means more, more complex um, uh, uh, trying to stabilize them and, and, and so forth. That's a very serious, uh, serious fracture where you have more than three pieces. Compression fracture, in the most common place you're going to see that is going to be in the uh, vertebrae, where the body of the vertebra is, is basically pushed. Um, falls, people who fall off roofs and land on their feet. I, I saw a significant compression fracture in an arborist who fell out of a tree in the tuna, like, I forget, like 25 or 30 feet and landed on his feet. And But all of his lumbar uh, vertebrae were, were fractured, and it's a compression fracture where, where the bone is compressed. Uh, spiral fracture is what it says, uh, usually long bones where it, it, it forms a sort of spiral crack. Uh, again, doesn't have to be complete, um, but in this case, what we have is two pieces here. Epiphyseal, very, very painful, very painful. What happens is the bone's ever so slightly weaker at the epiphyseal plate because that's an area of active bone growth. So you're going to see this a lot of the time, uh, you're going to see this in uh, pre-adolescence, you know, or early stage adolescence, the most common time that this sort of thing happens. It's also known as Salter Harris because of the people that originally described it. And what you're getting is a sort of swiveling fracture. It's sort of just twist and swivel, if you will, um, uh, at the epiphyseal plate. Then you have depressed fractures primarily uh, in the skull, but you can see it in other flat bones as well from time to time. And, and the issue here is that you have a depression that then impinges on, on the neural tissue, affects circulation is the number one thing. It affects the circulation, and then the tissue begins to die or, or it gets inflamed, usually death, all right, after a few minutes. And that's one of the reasons why if you get this sort of significant depression fracture dating back to the Incas, dating back to thousands of years ago, they knew that if they could relieve that pressure, that the uh, that the uh, that the uh, the neural the brain underneath could could resume function and so some of the earliest brain surgeries were done by the Incas that were that were basically cutting out that depressed fracture in order to allow the uh, the neural tissue to again have circulation these cells don't have a sense of humor if you lose glucose and, and oxygen they will they will die really quickly. Lastly, this one is, is, is strictly a juvenile, almost always a juvenile. I shouldn't say, you know, 100% anything. Green stick fractures are typically fractures of young bones where you get a break. And just like a, a, a stick that's green on a tree, when you break it, you only, you don't, you don't, it's not a, it's not a complete break. It just sort of splinters on one side and that's what's going on. So, uh, that's because these bones are much more pliant. There's still a, a relatively high amount of cartilage uh, in these bones, in, especially in young kids. 
And so that's why we call it a green stick fracture because it resembles a green stick on a tree that you try to break and it ends up splintering on one side but not breaking completely. Now bone healing is relatively slow and part of the reason that it's relatively slow is that you don't have the same amount of perfusion in the bone by and large, especially in the dense bone that you have in other tissues. So it's one of the slower healing bones. So it doesn't mean it can't heal, you know, in, in, in heal well and even heal stronger than the original fracture or the original bone, but nevertheless, it is a slower process. And it begins with an inflammatory process. That is, you get a hematoma, you get, um, you get, uh, uh, inflammatory factors. This is when most of the pain is going on uh, because of the inflammation and the, and the cytokines therein. The first thing, though, is that you get these uh, you get these uh, chondrocytes and fibroblasts. Uh, they the the inflammatory signals trigger them to begin growing and spreading. So the hematoma is full of cytokines that induce this. Uh, these these uh, cells, these chondrocytes, and shall we say bone precursors uh, to form, and then they will quickly lay down. You know, in the matter of a couple of weeks, quickly lay down uh, what's called a callus, which is a, a matrix of, of of fibers and collagen and cartilage. And then slowly from one end here and another end here, and even in some cases from this sort of uh, outer capsule, if you will, you'll begin to get ossification. And this is why um, many months or even years, and so the ossification is, first we have a, a sort of a spongy bone here and it gets progressively more dense over time, that for, for years you may have a noticeable bulge in that bone. Uh, like for instance, if you have a, an injury to the tibia, that's quite noticeable. Usually the surface, the front surface of the tibia is quite smooth. So you run uh, your hands down someone's uh, shin and it sort of generally is a relatively even surface there. But if they've had an injury or a partial or complete bone break, you can feel that bulge in there, for, usually oftentimes for months or years. And again, that spongy bone uh, is the first that's laid down and then it gets progressively more dense uh, as, as it goes. Some more pathophysiology for you, since the breaks are the most common, one of the next most common uh, disorders is known as osteoporosis, also known as osteopenia. The, this word means bone deficit, okay? So porosis is, is, describes the way the bone looks uh, in advanced stages. What we see going on is that the osteoclasts, the signals that, that promote osteoclast, um, seem to outweigh the signals that would promote formation of osteoblasts. So the osteoclasts outnumber the osteoblasts, which means you're taking up more bone than you're laying down, and so you have a net loss of, of bone mass. Uh, oftentimes in the spongy bone, um, but it can, it can be in other places. Um, this is why, for instance, the osteoporosis uh, you'll see it, in, you know, uh, manifest in in the posture of the patient because of the back. Um, the bodies of the uh, of the vertebrae are are primarily spongy bone internally, and so they're they're more susceptible. Um, the hormone ratio in women that have undergone gone menopause is is a contributing factor. Men can get osteoporosis just like women can. But the, 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 the shift of the sex hormones postmenopausally, uh, estrogen uh, skyrockets and you don't have any progesterone or uh, some of these other things that are part of the, the cycling, if you will, um, that, that shift in ratio seems to promote um, more osteoclast formation. And that's why sometimes when people are at risk of, uh, of uh, osteoporosis, they can, not, they can go hormone replacement therapy um, uh, in order to help stave that off. But the most, the, the most common man manifestation that you see pre-fracture 
is postural changes. You begin to see a, a noticeable increase in the curvature of the spine in a sort of a gravitropic way. Um, people often will f uh, break a bone and then fall. Okay, so but the but the bone break isn't detected until they fall. Um, treatment it varies. Um, it can you know uh, you know low calcium can also uh, exacerbate osteoporosis. If you have calcium absorption uh, deficit, that can exacerbate. So calcium supplements can help. Uh, hormone replacement therapy can help. But low-grade exercise and main, maintaining occupation are probably the best way to stave off osteoporosis. Um, people just, uh, because of mood and, 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 and slowing of the metabolism, may default to a more sedentary um, lifestyle just just out of out of the way they feel they just may not feel like exercising and so in an exercise in that in that in that good stress on the bone helps um, uh, establish an, an, an osteoblast signaling and so that's that's the treatment uh, for osteoporosis it can be nutritional it can be uh, pharmaceutical in terms of either uh, cytokine therapy or hormone replacement therapy, and just occupational therapy, um, getting these getting these patients out and about. Osteomalacia. This is often due to vitamin D deficiency. Again, it involves um, an aberration of of calcium regulation. Um, if you have a lack of vitamin D and calcium and you're young, um, uh, and where you in societies where covering is very very important, especially in very very conservative si societies where where uh, women are kept indoors and fully covered uh, much of the time, they can suffer from a lack of vitamin D, which can then screw up their calcium homeostasis. Right. So what's happening is you're losing calcium. Um, you will see, you can see it in children. We call it rickets in children. That's usually a vitamin D deficiency. It's all but gone away in countries that use vitamin D supplemented milk. But as we have sort of shifted to more vegetarian and vegan paradigms, the children of, vegeta of strict vegetarians and vegans um, are at, at, at increased risk. Uh, very easily uh, dealt with. Vitamin D is actually synthesized by just a little bit of exposure to sunlight. So just getting the kids outside, getting them active, maybe a little bit of vitamin D in the food, etc. So Paget's disease, this is where we get, uh, uh, again, it's an, and it's an imbalance of resorption versus formation. Now you're getting resorption, but you have this not organized, it, it becomes dysregulated reformation. And so you're getting loss of architecture, you're getting a, 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 a dystrophy um, uh, of, of the bone. And this can be really, really, really painful. You get bone spurs, for instance, is a sort of a, a bone spur is a very mild iteration of, uh, of a more extensive Paget's disease. It can be genetic, a lot of the time it is, it can be the result of viral, certain types of viral infections, though it's not entirely clear how that goes. The main treatment here is uh, medications that are designed to um, basically slow down uh, resorption. Uh, and, and thus, if you have less need for resorption, then reformation by default gets, uh, uh, gets slowed down as well. So the idea here is to just basically slow the bone down in general. Again, this can be really, really painful depending on how extensive the and disorganized the reformation is. Not super common, but uh, when it manifests, it manifests and it's quite painful. And so here's a cartoon showing what normal spongy bone will look like. And you can see that the, the, the cross beams, if you will, are so much thinner and this can occur certainly in the uh, the bodies of the uh, of the vert vertebrae bones it can also occur in the large uh, it's you're most susceptible to injury where the stresses are the greatest and those those are in articulations of the major supporting bones like like uh, the ball and socket here in the pelvis so the, the 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 femur if you will 
but you can see it in almost any long bone uh, uh, that that has um, a significant amount of uh, cancellous bone. Here's a, here's a, a, a juvenile. This is rickets. Okay, so that this bowing of the legs uh, as the child is uh, is ambula ambulating, that is to say they're up and walking, the manifestation gets worse and worse because the bones are not completely ossifying. Or when they do ossify, it's delayed, and so they begin ossifying when the bone has already been bent due to the increased stress loads of ambulation. So this completes our lecture on bone tissue. As always, I hope you took good notes. Uh, it's good to take notes because it helps you recall it better. Remember that when you're taking notes, don't just try to transcribe. That's a mistake. Okay? What you want to do is summarize, abbreviate. All right. You retain more than if you just try to remember it all. If, if everything's important, nothing is truly important. So you want to make sure you're summarizing, you're restating, because that's the secret to, uh, to, to, to learning large amounts of material, is to sort of re-paraphrase, go through it in your mind, think about it rather than just pure memorization. So thank you for your time. I uh, hope you found this lecture useful, and uh, I'll uh, see you soon. Bye now.